First of all, I just want to remark on what an absolutely beautiful spot this campus is. And it's a really a uh, pleasure to be here. Um, it's quite a little bit different from Delhi and, uh, in, in a very nice way. Um, so what I want to talk about today is learning, and in particular how learning can change the world. And we also need to learn how learning can change the world. So there's a little bit of a double entendre in, in the title of my talk. And in a particular, if I could borrow that one second, I, I want to talk about a project that I've been involved in now for, um, actually for, for almost 40 years. It, it's taken this form only for about six years, but it's a 40-year project. And my goal today, my reason for being here, is because I want your minds to think about my problem. And hopefully some of you will come up with some ideas that can help advance the project. Because I know that I don't have all the ideas, uh, but I also know that it's uh, an important problem. It's an important problem for, for the state of Goa. It's an important problem for India. It's actually an important problem for the entire world. And so um, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to actually sort of treat this lecture more as a case study than as the, the description of a solution. I'm going to present a problem. I'll present some partial solutions to that problem, some mistakes we've made in trying to reach our goal. And hopefully, someone or some ones in this room might be able to help us move forward, either move forward here, move forward in India, or move forward anywhere in the world, or everywhere in the world. So, the problem that we're trying to solve is one of learning. We're trying to give every child the opportunity to learn. And while most children in the world go to school, most schools aren't places where learning happens. And so one of the things that we're trying to do is not just um, give children an education. That's something that's done to you. But rather, we want to give children an opportunity to engage in learning. That's something they do. Learning is something you do. It's not something that's done to you. So we're really trying to not just give the opportunity, but give an opportunity that really is a learning opportunity as opposed to an instructional opportunity. So this isn't about you know, setting up a big cloud somewhere with lectures and giving children access to lectures. Because in fact, we know that's not learning. When we first started this project, I went around the world talking to people. In particular, I talked to a lot of engineers, not so many management students. And I asked them to describe a great learning moment in their lives. And I was, I, I, I actually I came to India, I was in Thailand, I was in Australia, I was all over Latin America, I was in Africa, I was everywhere. And every time I asked this question, I got the same answer. Everyone answered the question exactly the same way. Everyone said, my great learning moment was when I was trying to solve a problem I was passionate about. And in, in trying to solve that problem, I engaged in debugging, I engaged in all these different activities, I talked to people, I did research, I tried this, it failed, I tried that, it failed, I made observations, I iterated, I, I changed, and I learned. Not a single person told me that the answer to that question was going to lecture. No one's great learning moment was going to lecture, not even my lecture. And so, and it was universal. Every single person answered the question the same way. It was a different problem they were solving, a different passion. But it was problem solving that was the passion. It was problem solving that was a great learning moment. And I, I, ironically, that's not what school's all about. And I know this because, first of all, I went to school. But I also know this because I asked a follow-on question to these engineers. I asked them, okay, you just told me what you know is a great learning moment in your life. Now let's design an intervention for school. And immediately they turned around and they forgot 
what they know and remember what they believe school is supposed to be. And again, I got the exact same answer from everyone I spoke to. They designed electronic worksheets. They designed electronic mass production mode learning. So they, they, they forgot about what learning is and, and, and switched back to what they believe school is supposed to be. And so one of the things that we're trying to do with this project is really make it be about learning, what we know learning is, not what we believe school is. We're going to, you know, schools in reality, and one of the challenges of this project is how do you deal with the reality of school and the institutionalization of school and the administration of school and, and the, this, this terrible habit that they have in school of measuring the thing, valuing the things they can measure, but not measuring the things that we value. And, and we, we've got to break that mindset somehow. And again, I, I'm going to tell you a few ways that we've tried and failed, and a few ways we've tried and succeeded. And hopefully, again, some of you will come up with ideas that will be better than our ideas and, and really make this change. Learning to change the world. We're everywhere. We are literally everywhere on the, on, on the planet. And because we're everywhere there are kids. There are even a few kids in Antarctica. Um, so um, this is not a, a, a local problem, although you know, if we solve it locally, maybe that solution will, will apply somewhere else. But this is a global problem. This problem exists in every country. It exists in every culture. It exists north, south, east, west, rich, poor, everywhere. And there are kids everywhere. So, 40 years ago, a, a, a gentleman named Seymour Pamper was studying with Piaget in Geneva. And he got the idea in his head that computation was a thing to think of. And he started working with children and computers and eventually developed uh, a series of interventions, most notably uh, a, a programming language called Logo, which immersed children in computational thinking and computational geometry. And Logo was, was one of the early, was actually probably the first um, real, it was, it was the first language for programming that was geared towards children, and it was really one of the first serious efforts to think using computation as, as an aid or a boost to thinking. And Seymour came to MIT and, and was one of my mentors at MIT. Um, and we did together many, many different projects, many, many different pilot projects. In 1982, we did a pilot of one-to-one -one computing, one computer per child. It wasn't a laptop yet, because there was no such thing as a laptop in 1982. But it was one computer per child interventions. We did it, uh, we did it in Pakistan, we did it in Thailand, no, no, Pakistan, and Senegal, and in Colombia, 1982. <coughs> So this, this, and, and, and we got great results. And we did projects in Thailand, we did projects everywhere. One project after another, we did projects in, in, in Boston, which is where MIT is, we did projects in, in the hill country, in Lansakta, a little village in, in Thailand. Uh, we did projects in Brazil, we did projects everywhere. Rich, poor, black, white, red, green, male, female, everything. And every time we went somewhere, great things happened. The problem was we had no way of bringing these ideas to scale. We did a little pilot there, a little pilot here, and we just, you know, we, we got to the point where, you know, we knew we were on to the right thing, but we didn't know how to actually get it to children. And then in, in 2005, Actually, a few years before 2005, a colleague of ours, Bernie Kirchner, um, he's a Far East correspondent for Newsweek, he had fallen in love with Cambodia. And he put all his time and effort into Cambodia. He started the first newspaper in Cambodia after Pol Pot. And he built an orphanage in Cambodia for a lot of, and a lot of orphans in Cambodia at the time. And uh, one of the things that he decided to do with the, the, the orphans was give them some of these technologies that we've been developing at MIT. 
and the kids became quite proficient with computing. And then he got another idea, which is to set up schools in rural communities in Thailand. You know, you got to open it. So now you got to turn it on. And then just, you know, play a little bit and pass it on so people can get experience. Once he, um, he started setting up schools in, in, in rural villages, and then he'd send these orphanages out, orphans out to these schools that get adopted by these communities, and they would be the computer experts in the village. And he started soliciting help, funds, and resources to expand his rural school program in Cambodia. And one of those schools ended up getting built by a colleague of mine, Nicholas Negroponte, and his wife Elaine. And Lane is actually still running the school in Cambodia. It's about, uh, it's, it's a pretty remote place, about eight hours from the nearest airport. But um, in order to get computers into the school, they decided, well, let's send laptops, because desktops is just too much to ship. Laptops are smaller, more compact, and they're, 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 they've got a battery because the power supply is unreliable. If, if it actually, they, they brought in the generator. The only source of electricity in this particular village is a generator at the school that they built. Um, but the, so they, they bought a bunch of uh, Tufbook, Panasonic Tufbook computers on eBay and, and brought them to this village. And there were about 100 kids at the school and they set up a, a VSAT system to get internet into the school. And they gave every kid one of these tough books. And the kids started engaging in all the kinds of things that kids do. Uh, I'm going to get to, to the details of that in a few minutes. Uh, but then what happened was all of a sudden, um, the school population, population went from 100 children to 200 children. Because 100 children who weren't going to school saw these kids with laptops and said, hey, this looks pretty good. So they suddenly there were all these kids coming to school. And it turns out that the internet connection, that wasn't really a problem. Because you take the internet connection, suddenly you've got twice as many users. Well, the bandwidth is half as much. But you can tolerate that. The problem is you can't cut the laptops in half. Now, you can time share the laptops. But one of the things that we've learned is that the real power of having that computer is the informal time you spend with it. The time you spend with it just messing around and exploring taking risks and, and, and trying things. The formal structured time in the classroom is not so important as, as the informal time you spend with the computer. So anyway, so Nicholas got the epiphany that, you know, the real problem is not so much, again, connecting kids to the cloud. The real problem is actually giving them access to computers. And at the time, the tough book cost over $2,000 US. And this least expensive laptop in the market was over $1,000 US. But we got together and decided that we could build the laptop for $100. And that was the origin of the project. Now, we actually still, after six years, haven't reached that $100 price point yet. We're still hovering a little less than 10,000 rupees for the laptop. But it's, it's as I'm going to describe, it's quite a pattern. Again, this is sort of origins. Uh, this is Seymour in Senegal, one-to-one -one computing in Senegal. And this is the school in Cambodia. This was a, a tough book. And you can see the satellite dish in the background. Um, turns out that the price of the computer is only one factor. And, 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 and ironically, or not ironically, unfortunately, and this is actually one of the things that you should think about try to help me with. Every single time we go to a government to say, buy our computers, the only thing they look at is price. The only thing they look at is price. And yet, if you brought any other computer into this village in Ethiopia, there'd be no way to power it all. Because this is the only computer that will run off a of solar panel. It's the greenest computer on the planet. So you can buy a less expensive computer, but if you can't charge it, power it on, what good is it doing? A bunch of other things we did with the computers um, that, that, that make it 
unique to the purpose that we designed it for, which is kids and learning. Well, one of the things we do, if I can borrow that for just one second. Oops. Kids drop things. So we, we want to make sure that the computer still works even after you drop it. Well, the battery popped out a little bit, so we'll have to pop the battery back in. But basically, you know, it's, it, it, uh, it's okay. It'll turn back on. Um, we gave it a handle because kids like to carry things. Um, the kids in an way to go to school on horseback with their computers. Um, the, the computer has um, a sunlight readable display because a lot of kids, like these kids, school is outdoors. There's no shelter for school. Uh, the, the computer has um, built-in Wi-Fi that operates without infrastructure. In other words, the kids can work peer-to-peer, -peer, collaborate with each other without being on the internet. It sounds a little bit weird, but you know, actually, if you think about it for a second, Wi-Fi, and there's Wi-Fi all over this campus, is just two-way radio. And you can use your two-way radio to talk to a little box there that takes you to the internet, or you can use your two-way radio just to talk to another computer. And so you can sit under a tree with our laptop and have 10 kids do some group project together without any infrastructure. So you don't need to bear the cost of internet, except when you want. Um, and I can go on and on and on and on and on about how if you look at the total cost of ownership of this laptop, it, it's, it's a small percentage of any other solution, including these inexpensive tablets that they still have failed to build in India, that someday maybe they will build. But even that inexpensive tablet, in terms of a lifetime solution, is more expensive than this laptop. But, again, no government bid has ever taken into consideration any of these other features. There's a couple of other things that are going on, little things. So for example, in this laptop, the battery is designed to have a uh, um, 200 recharge cycle lifetime, which means for someone like me, it lasts maybe about a year and a half before I have to replace it. To re replace the battery in this laptop costs me more than buying that laptop. That laptop has a battery that's designed for 500 recharge cycles, it's going to last about five years. And to replace that battery costs $10. And the chemistry of that battery is such that if this battery catches on fire, it burns at 100 degrees Celsius. I mean, 1,000 degrees Celsius. If that battery catches on fire, it burns at 100 degrees Celsius. Which would you rather have in the hands of kids? 